Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, I'm so sorry about yesterday. For some reason, the audio didn't work, so I'm hoping it works today. As you hop on, let me know if the audio is working. Um, make sure we're good. I have no idea what happened yesterday. It was a long day. I was tired already. I had started about 3.30 that morning up and uh, taken some friends of ours from Rhode Island to the airport. And then uh, we had a long day yesterday, staff planning. Good morning, Shelly. Can you hear me this morning? Just want to make sure the microphone's working today and uh, instead of like it was yesterday. But um, I started at 3.30, took people to the airport, uh, then came back, got ready, had a long day of staff planning, and then left there and went to down uh, about 4.30 or 5 in the afternoon uh, to visit with a lady in our church whose brother's in hospice. Good morning, Renata. Um, so I spent some time down there at hospice with her and then went to a Bible study last night. So I didn't get home until about 9.30 or 10 last night. So I'm, I'm, if I fall asleep while we're doing devotions this morning, you'll understand why. <laughs> it's been a long couple of days, but a very good couple of days. Um, so I appreciate you guys understanding. I apologize again for the microphone not working yesterday. I did an 11-minute, 12-minute devotion video, however, however long it was, and all you could do is see my mouth moving. So I hope you could read lips. If so, you, you were great. You were right there with me. But if you're like me, you're like, I'm out. I got nothing. So, <laughs> But I'm glad to be back with you guys uh, this morning doing devotions. Last night at our Bible study, was with I was with one of my pastor friends who's a Nazarene pastor, Dan Bohai. And he was telling me about hey, this man. Is just, I love this guy. He's one of... He, one that I consider one of my pastors. And uh, Dan was uh, talking and he said, he, he, this man's amazing. He reads his Bible through every three weeks. And so that morning he had read Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Job uh, that morning. So I was sitting there and we were talking. I was like, well, I read Second Chronicles uh, <laughs> and, then, um, and then Ezra. And this morning I read Nehemiah. So I'm, I'm not where he's at yet. I am still, I, I will have read... I'll finish today, and I'll have read my Bible through in three months. So it takes him three weeks, takes me three months. I'm a little slower reader than he is, uh, but that's where we're at on it. So I was doing my devotions this morning, and I read the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is an amazing, amazing book. I, I love this book on leadership. It's one of the best, it's, it is the best book on leadership outside uh, of, well, anything. It's, it's just the best book on leadership. It's it's got so many lessons and so many things for us to learn and and one that I have gone through with leadership groups in the past and, and taught leadership out of but in this book of, of Nehemiah we see a man named Nehemiah who is the king's cupbearer and uh, he comes into the king and and talks about how he's he, he's he's just absolutely destroyed because a friend had come to visit him and he found out the walls of Jerusalem and the city's torn down so he comes in before the king to bring the king his, his drink and he, he's kind of down and depressed, and the king looks at him and says, well, you've never been like this before. You're always a very upbeat person. What is wrong with you? So he tells him what's going on and uh, asks for permission to go and rebuild the walls, and he does. Uh, the king gives it to him, and not only does he give him permission to go rebuild the walls, he provides all the supplies, provides for his safety, provides everything for him so that he's able to go do it. And when he gets there, he faces some difficulties. He begins to evaluate the land at night, secretly going out and looking at the walls, and nobody knows really what's what he's there for, what he's doing, his his plan yet. He hasn't told him his plan, and but as soon as he gets there, the first thing that happens is he talks to the people, and in chapter two he says, "Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace." Then I told them how the gracious hand of God had been on me about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, "Yes, let's rebuild the wall." So they began the good work. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, and Gershom the Arab heard of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? They asked. I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. And from that moment on, uh, Nehemiah faces opposition from Sanballat, Tobiah, Gershom, and some others. And there's a principle there that whenever we are doing something for God, we are going to face opposition. Doesn't matter what it is, we're going to face opposition. There are people who are going to try to stop us from doing what God has called us to do. They're going to try to interfere with God's plan. They're going to try to put us down personally. They're going to attack us personally. They're going to make it real personal. It's never about the facts of rebuilding the wall. It was never about any of the things that were happening there. They just didn't want it to happen. They didn't like it. So they, instead of dealing with the issues, they went personal on it and attacked Nehemiah. Whoa, 
sorry about that the uh, microphone the, the whole camera just jumped on me I I moved my foot on the rug that's on he here so I apologize it probably scared you a little bit so what happens they get angry chapter 4 verse 1 Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall then verse 4 I prayed hear us O God for we are being mocked may their scoffing fall back on their own heads God just let it come right back on kind of like what Esther ha happened in Esther with Mordecai who built the the, the the gallows for Naaman and it turned back and he was hung on the own gallows that he had built to kill that man and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land do not ignore their guilt do not blot out their sins for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders at last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city for the people had worked with enthusiasm but when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and Ammonites and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired they were furious they all made plans to come and fight against us and to throw us into confusion but we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves they didn't go out to do battle with these guys they just prayed and it goes back to something that I've said many, many times that I heard a, a friend of mine say, and that's, you can talk about me all you please, but I'll talk about you on my knees. Um, we're, we need to go to God and allow him to fight our battles. And that's what Nehemiah and them people did here. They prepared just in case, but instead of going out and trying to attack and, and respond and all those things, instead of doing that, they hit their knees and they prayed and allowed God to fight for them. And as you go through here, that's chapter four. When you get over into chapter five, uh, there's some amazing, well, the end of chapter 4, it says, Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight with your brothers and sons and daughters and your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we, they, we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to work on the wall. Uh, down to verse 17, the laborers carried on the work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. So they, they had a weapon in one hand, the sword in one hand, and a trowel in the other trying to rebuild the wall. So they were prepared for battle, but they didn't allow the opposition to stop the work that was moving forward and when we face opposition when people attack us for doing what God has called us to do a lot of times it can distract us from the mission God has given us and Nehemiah is a perfect example of don't allow personal attacks to distract us from the mission God has given us to do because then the enemy wins the enemy will beat us if we allow it to distract us, they don't have to, to get us to, to do much except for just stop doing what we're doing. That's the goal. Now, the enemy is not really our enemy, as we would think. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of righteousness and of darkness. So it's not the enemy is not our enemy. The enemy is Satan. So that's, it makes it easier for us to, like Jesus said, to love your enemies when we realize that our enemy is not actually our enemy. Our enemy is actually Satan. So when that person attacks us or when those people come at us and we're supposed to love them, it makes it easier to know that it's not really them. The devil's got a foothold in their life, and he's using them to attack us. But to go on in our story, you get into chapter 5, and some neat things happen there, and Nehemiah is kind of setting the people straight. And, and in chapter 6, we get verse 1, Sam Bout, Tobiah, Gershom, the Arabite, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set the doors of the gates. So Sam Bout and Gershom sent... Uh, a message to me to meet them in one of the villages in the plain of Ono, but I realized they were plotting to harm me. So I replied by sending this message to them. I'm engaged in a great work, so I cannot come. Why should I stop working and come and meet with you? What a powerful thing there. Why should I stop doing what God's called me to do to mess with you? Uh, you're a distraction. I'm not going to do it. So what did they? how did they handle it? Four times they sent the same message, and each time he gave them the same reply. Finally, the fifth time they send a letter to Nehemiah saying, hey, we are actually, it starts in uh, verse number ba, 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 four, five, uh, six. There is a rumor among the surrounding nations. So they're starting this letter to Nehemiah saying, hey, we've got some rumors we're going to spread about you. <laughs> Basically trying to make it look like he's going to overthrow the king who had been so gracious to him and given him everything that he needed and allowed him to come rebuild the wall. So we haven't been able to distract you. Yeah, we're not. It's an amazing book. I love it. Um, amazing study. Uh, I think John's doing it right now up there or getting ready to start uh, maybe tonight even in his Bible study up there in Rhode Island on Nehemiah. But they send this letter. They're trying to you know, distract him even more. They're trying to spread rumors and gossip about him all the way back to the king so that the king will get mad and try to stop them. So we can't stop you. So we're going to get the authority, your authorities. We're going to get the people that you're accountable to. 
and then we're really going to get you. We're going to spread rumors about you and try to attack you. So what happens? Verse 8, I replied, Nehemiah replies, uh, there is no truth in any part of your story. You're making the, the whole thing. <laughs> they were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. <laughs> Nehemiah says, you're trying to distract me and discourage me by saying you're going to spread these rumors about me and attack me. Uh, but let me tell you, all that makes me do, make me want to do, is double down and get the work done and, and even go at it even harder. So they they continue and try to trap Nehemiah, try to get him to meet with them. They even hire a priest to try to trick him to committing a sin and doing something wrong. And, and so Nehemiah understands it, sees it, avoids the, the pitfall. So finally, chapter 6, verse 15. So on top, October 2nd, the wall was finished just 52 days after we begun. Cooper's barking at something. Uh, when our enemies and surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. During those 52 days, many letters were sent back and forth between Tobiah and the nobles of Jerusalem. For many in Judah had sworn allegiance to him. Uh, verse 19, they kept telling me about Tobiah's good deeds. And they told him everything I said. And Tobiah kept sending threatening letters to intimidate me. So Tobiah, this enemy, this one who's trying to stop the work of God, was related to a lot of people in Judah. And so he had all of his friends and family going to Nehemiah, trying to sing his praises and, and build him up as being something that he just wasn't. Something great, something spiritual, something godly. And, and Nehemiah says, all you've done is tell me how great he is and then turn around and tell him everything that I've said. You're basically a spy for him and, and you're you're going against your own people. You're going against God. You go through the next chapter and you see there's all kinds of things about the families and, and what's happening there, the, those that are returning from exile and all of that. Chapter 8, Ezra gets up and reads the law. He reads the Bible and the people stand and they listen for hours and God does a work in his people. And then they backslide again. In chapter 9, oh, they well, they continue to uh, to turn towards God. They continue this revival. They're confessing their sins the beginning of chapter 9. And they pray. And it, it talks about, there's all kinds of amazing things in here. We could spend all day and, and we could spend weeks in here. But Nehemiah eventually leaves town, goes back. But then he comes back for a visit to check things out to the, towards the end of Nehemiah. And when he comes back to visit, some interesting things happen. He finds that people have been backsliding. They're not honoring the Sabbath day. They're not following through on the commitments that they had made to God. In fact, in chapter number 13, verse 4, uh, well, let me let me just go back to the beginning of chapter 13 because this is amazing. On the same day, the book of Moses was being read to the people and passages found uh, that said no Ammonite or Moabite should be permitted to enter the assembly of God for they had not provided for the Israelites with food and water in the wilderness instead they hired Balaam to curse them that's a story back um, in, in the Kings uh, where they hired Balaam to try to come in this, this prophet and pronounce a curse on Israel but God wouldn't let him do it in fact he pronounces a curse on the people who hired him and a blessing on Israel so it backfired on them trying to get the, the prophet to come in and speak evil against God's people when this passage of the law was read all those of foreign descent immediately excluded from the assembly before this had happened Eliashib the priest so one of the priests of Israel who had been appointed as supervisor of the storerooms of the temple of God and who was also a relative of Tobiah remember Tobiah the guy who's coming out against uh, Nehemiah had converted a large storage room and placed it at Tobiah's disposal so they're actually giving Tobiah this man who's not a part of the family this man who has been an enemy this man who is not a Jew they're giving him space to use for whatever he wants in the temple. He has no business being there. One, he's not allowed to be there, and he shouldn't have had any right. No one should have let him, this dude in there. So what happens? Verse 7, When I arrived back in Jerusalem, I learned about Eliashib's evil deed in providing Tobiah a room in the courtyards of the temple of God. I became very upset and threw all Tobiah's belongings out of the room. Nehemiah comes in and he starts cleaning house again. Throws all this junk that had been allowed into the temple out. He goes on down in verse 25, talking to the people about how they have intermarried and brought in people from outside. God had told them not to. He told them to, to keep the purity of the nation of Israel. Don't marry outside wives because that's what Solomon did and it caused Solomon to fall into sin. He began to follow his wives and worship the gods of his wives. So 
What happens when Nehemiah comes back and finds out about this? Verse 25, so I confronted them and called down curses on them. I beat some of them and pulled out their hair. <laughs> it, it turned into a brawl because these guys were not following what they had, the commitment that they had made prior to this in, that we read earlier in Nehemiah. They weren't following through with the commitments that they had made to God. So Nehemiah comes in and clings house. Uh, verse 26, wasn't this exactly what led Solomon, King Solomon, into sin? I demanded. There was no king from any nation who could compare to him. And God loved him and made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign wives. One of the sons of Joida, uh, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, had married the daughter of Sanballat. So even one of the sons of the priest had married Sanballat's daughter. Remember Sanballat and Tobiah from the beginning coming out against Nehemiah and doing battle? So now we've got the priests, the leaders, the spiritual leaders marrying the children of these enemies of God and God's people who are trying to distract them from getting the work of God done. So there's no difference. They're not setting any separation between them. So, so I banished him from my presence. Nehemiah just kicks him straight out. You know, a, Nehemiah is a no-nonsense kind of a leader. And when you have a no-nonsense kind of a leader, it can be abrasive at times. Especially when they have a clear calling from God and are headed towards what God has called them to do. And that's what happened here with Nehemiah. Nehemiah knew the mission that God had given him to do. And he was not going to be distracted from it, no matter what happened. The personal attacks, the threats of war, the rumors and lies and letters that were being sent back to the king, he didn't allow it. And in fact, he held the people accountable to continue in the direction that they were going, that, that they had committed to go towards the Lord. So... Cooper's coming up off of the backyard from running around playing. You being a good boy, Cooper? Good boy. So the lesson for all of us is when God has put something in our heart to do, which is all of us, God, is, God has a plan for all of us. We should not allow anyone or anything to distract us from the mission God has given us. We got to go for it. The time is short. We have no promise of tomorrow. Let's keep our nose to the grindstone, as they say. Let's Let's follow God. Let's do what he wants and let's live for the audience of one. Let's not be distracted by people. I think you can see Cooper there in the back. He's, he's coming to check things out. Coop, you going to say hi to everybody? Let's not allow anything to distract us from what God has called us to do. Let's get the job done. Let's move forward for the Lord. Let's not allow anyone or anything to distract us. What's God asked you to do? What's God calling you to do with your life? I can tell you what God has called me to do. God's called me to pastor. God's called me to teach his word. I love it. There's nothing else I would do with my whole life. I love God's word. I love sharing God's word. I love reading God's word. Um, I made a commitment to him. I'll spend an, at least an hour with him in reading every morning and an hour in prayer with him every morning. And I'm, I'm working, doing that. That's, that's what one of the things he's called me. The first calling of a disciple is to be with him. When Jesus walked past the men that were the fishermen, Peter and, and Paul, or Peter and uh, Andrew and uh, James and John, he, he first called them, he said, follow me. The first calling of a disciple is to follow me. Come with me. Be with me. So we as Christians, we need to be with him. That's our first calling. Be with him. Don't allow anything to distract you from that. Don't allow anything to come into that time where you walk with God. It's a higher way of living. And I want to encourage you and, and, and push you to a higher way of living, a walk with God. That's where we all need to be. I, if I could give you my desire to read God's word and to spend time with him, I would. Because I, I can't explain to you what it does for me every day and how it charges me every day. And, and the, just to spend time with him and to walk with him and to talk with him. And when I'm praying, it's not always me talking. A lot of times it's me just listening. If I could give you that. If I could put that hunger in you and that feeling that you, you th that I have every day, I would give it to you because it's amazing, better than any drug that's out there. I wish you could experience that close, intimate relationship with God. And I know some of you have, but I wish you could have that. I want that for you. I'm calling you to a higher way of life, a higher level of living, a higher going closer to Christ, taking the next step up towards him, a higher way of life. And we're going to talk more about that over the next few months and and that's really kind of my, well, I'm really letting the cat out of the bag. So don't tell anybody, those of you that are watching, but that's my word is higher for next year, 2022, God gave to me. That's, I've already been praying and God's been clear. This is what I want higher next year, higher. Come closer, get up here, come up with me. So that's my word for next year. We'll talk more about that as we get closer. But 
I want to encourage you today. Stay close. Don't be distracted from what God has called you to do, from what God has given you to do. There's going to be sand ballots, Tobias, and Gershoms. They're, they're there. They'll always be there. They're going to attack you because you're doing something and they're not. So don't be distracted. Keep the mission of the gospel, sharing the gospel. Keep the mission that God has given us as the thing to do. Keep the main thing the main thing, as they say, and stay true to what God has called you to do. I want to pray this morning, and, and then I'll get off of here. I want to pray for Elise and her brother Timothy Edwards. Uh, Timothy's the one that I spent some time with last night who was in hospice. We want to pray for Tim. Um, the, the family has is, is, is asked me to pray, and I went down and anointed him and prayed for him yesterday. We, they wanted him to make it to at least today. So we're praying for a complete healing, and if, even if that healing means God taking him to heaven, that's okay. Because remember, we, as we talked about a few weeks ago, it's our job, our responsibility is to be faithful. The results is God's job. Me, obey. Him, results. So my job is to pray. It's his job for the results. So we want to pray for Timothy, that God will um, be with him and, and heal him. We want to pray for Elise as she's going through this tough time, and her brother as well, who's in from Washington, uh, D.C. area. So pray for their family. Tough time for their family right now. And for our kids who are in school, a lot of people are ill right now. I know um, several are. So let's let's keep them in our prayers today. So I want to pray. Dad, I love you, and thank you so much for your word. Thank you for giving us this book of Nehemiah where we can learn leadership principles that you, from a man who was given a mission from you. And, Lord, you've given all of us a mission. Help us to stay true to it and follow after you. Give us the strength to walk forward for you. Give us the power uh, to live in the calling that you have given to us. Lord, for Elise, I pray for her that you would give her comfort. Lord, I pray for Timothy, that you would be with him as, as his body is just, he's coming to the end. Spending time with him yesterday, he wasn't awake. That They don't expect him to wake up. They were amazed he made it through night before last. And I haven't heard if he made it through last night, but I believe that he did. I have faith. Lord, I pray that you would be with their family. It's a difficult time to lose someone that you care about. So I pray you'd wrap your arms of love and mercy and compassion and grace around them and be with them today. Pray for our kids who are in school. Lord, help them to see us as parents, grandparents, adopted parents, adopted grandparents, foster parents, whatever we are, adults in their life, to be moving to a higher level with you, to be walking with you. Help them to get that desire, that hunger from us. I love you. Thank you so much for what you've done for me and speaking to me today. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. I hope you have a great day. It's a little overcast here, and I'm freezing to death, so I'm going inside. Love you guys. See you tomorrow.